Thank you, everyone, and welcome to tonight's um, Board of Education meeting. We are going to focus tonight on our um, budget. Tonight is a budget working session, so um, we'll be going through the the um, workings of the budget. We have a couple of we have a couple of other items, but our primary conversation today is going to be about um, the budget. So with that, I will start us with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to let you know that the hearing and privilege of the floor um, will not take place tonight. But again, there is on our website a place for questions and answers. Um, we strongly encourage you to share your feelings with the school through that website and things that you really want to see in the budget, things that um, are of less critical importance to you, although I don't think anything is less critical when it comes to the school. But, but please share with us your thoughts through that website. Um, that way the whole community gets to, to share in your wisdom and we really do appreciate that. Um, next, I'm going to move to a discussion on junior varsity sports with the superintendent. Thanks, Dave. And Karen, I'm gonna ask you to put up that first slide in my slide deck. Thank you. So last week, the board had asked me if I would come back and take another look, or actually I volunteered to come back and take another look at the feasibility of us offering junior varsity sports. And to do that, we um, did a few things. One was we had our construction manager evaluate the fields that are most recently constructed and those still needing uh, work, and then speak to Shaker Flats, who are our field folks about what was left to be done on the new fields. Um, I talked with Jamie and Drew also talked with Jamie in terms of uh, the five teams that we have, um, five sports that we're playing, I should say, four of which require field space and how we were working that on the main field. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, or ask Drew to speak about our human resource uh, that's currently required uh, for the time we're spending on that main field. So on our new fields, all the new beautiful fields we've had installed um, need to be rolled and smoothed before we use them. Uh, that is part of what we do to guarantee our warranty. According to Shaker Flats, in order to do that, the snow has to be off the fields. The ground must be thawed at least the first couple of inches before that can be done. And temps should consistently be in the 40s. We're not quite there, but getting there. And usually those things happen within about a one month span of time. Our tentative plan is to have our fields rolled if they're ready on April 8th and 9th, Shaker Flats will do that work. And if the fields can be rolled on April 8th and 9th, play can begin on or about April 12th on those new fields. That will make sure that our warranty holds that all of the work that is supposed to be completed, um, the vast majority to make those uh, fields playable is completed and would put them uh, in play for spring. On our main field right now, uh, we have two varsity teams practicing in each of our time blocks. So they're sharing the field half and half. On days when we have a competition, so for example, this week we have competitions on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The main field is in use until 8.30 p.m. And we have increased our evening, evening staffing to address these changes. Because you might recall, we went from a closed campus to opening for practices till 4.30, then extending that time. And now that we're on the main field, extending that time further. I'm going to ask Drew to talk a little bit about what buildings and grounds are doing in addition to 
uh, their regular work in terms of this extra play. So I've had a, um, a maintenance mechanic being at the fields from the time that the practices start until we shut the lights off at at around 8, 8.30 every night when practices are, are done um, to make sure that the gates are secured, the fields are clean and cleared of any debris for the next day, and that traffic in and around the uh, facility is what it's supposed to be, which is the athletes and coaches. So we're going to continue to do that until the end of the spring season, um, utilizing savings that we realized from not running certain sports. We didn't spend the money and we're reallocating it. Uh, to this uh, safety and security measure. Thank you, Sue. So, all of that said, um, I do not believe we can, um, certainly within our own boundaries, offer junior varsity sports during this very shortened season. There was a question last week about looking at fields in the community, and although um, that is certainly one idea. I will be quite honest. I did not go out to the community to solicit fields because many of them were still under snow and the ground is frozen. Um, so, frankly, I'm not sure I would put my children on those fields anyways. Um, we have our hands full with the four um, varsity sports we are playing and then we are offering JV in volleyball. Uh, so I hope. Uh, this helps you to understand how we reached the decision we did in terms of junior varsity sports. I am hopeful that it comes spring. Uh, when we look at the new fields that we have in use, we will be back to being able to let any youngster who's interested in sports try out and play. Uh, right now, I don't think we can do that. Uh, we are going to um, amend our protocols. We talked a bit about that last week because the um, protocols in terms of masking and or, I'm sorry, a health check and or a temperature check if you haven't done your uh, app for students who are going to play. And we're also going to amend them now because we're working to have uh, spectators in as of March 22nd, next Monday. So that's what I have to present to you in terms of information and JV sports. And I would ask Dave to open the floor to discussion. Okay, so um, why don't I just open it up and um, Hal, why don't you go first here? Uh, okay, uh, I'm not sure what much discussion there is, I appreciate. All the work that the administrators and the AD and everybody, you know, does, as I've said the last 3 weeks before I started my. My rant, I guess, so I do appreciate everybody. Um, I, it, you know, it's just disheartening. I know all of us are disheartened over the fact that we can't do that for for our kids that want to play sports or cheerlead. Again, the only thing, as I said, in an email this week to everybody was that, you know, is there a way in, in the sports? I get they, they won't travel with the teams, they won't play with the teams, but is there a possibility of doing a practice squad? Um, you know, I know football, obviously, uh, that's, uh, they're going to cut some kids on the team. I know we had said about the seniors, um, but I wasn't sure if that was something that still could be considered or not. Uh, other than that, I guess I really don't have anything else I haven't said for the last three weeks. So thank you. Kim. Um, no, I really don't have any questions on okay. it. I mean, just it is what it is at this point and hopefully we'll be back to where we need to be next year. But yeah. with the COVID, it is what it is. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going through guys just to make it easier to, to speak. So if you don't really have anything, don't worry about anything, Pam. be able to offer them but we're in a very strange situation right now with the COVID and stuff and what is 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 thanks pam oh uh, rick 
Yeah, it it is disheartening, but I appreciate uh, looking into it and trying to make it viable. Did were were any of the elementary school fields considered? Rick, the elementary school field, which we have outside groups wanting to use them, working with the athletic director, we don't typically get on those to April, mid-April, because of the ground being frozen or wet. So they're not in play right now either. Yeah, I mean, were they considered for JV? No. They're not ready to be used right now. Um, and I think the JE was more about the, not only the fields, but the ability to have them supervised and, and, and coached the actual resources on the human side. Okay. And for the, for the staff that's supervising the fields, uh, the, the all sport fields, where, where are they stationed? Can they, can they, they can see the entire area? They're usually inside the field. Uh, uh, right now, I have Dennis Cooper doing it. Um, he's inside the fields okay. and patrolling the other fields too in the truck company, the district truck. So he's all over the camp, you know, all over this for me. Got gotcha. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you, Rick. Um, uh, Dave? Uh, I don't have any anything to add other than a thank you for uh, the hard work looking into this for us. We appreciate it. Dan. Um, thanks, Dave. You know, I'm not um, close enough to, you know, what's going on in our actual fields. I'm not, you know, uh, I don't have the expertise that people like Drew and Jamian and um, Susan and others in our district have. So, um, you know, I think it's important to defer to those people who do have the expertise. And um, if they say that it's not ready and we can't do JV, then I think we can't do JV. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm feeling pretty much the same as Dan at this point. Um, I love sports as I have stated many times and showed by my years of being involved, but you know, if they're telling me they did the best they can, I trust them and believe them. So all right. Um next is on the agenda is the um, approval of the protocol for the United um, Bowling. Can I get a motion? A motion to approve the protocol for Unified Bowling for inclusion in the participation in high risk sports to be conducted in accordance with the all requirements prescribed by Schenectady County Public Health Services included in the list of high risk sports on March 8th, 2021 agenda. Thank you, Kim. Can I get a second? I'll second. Oops. Got two seconds. Whichever one, Bobby, you heard. Um, open for discussion. This is great. So happy about this. Yeah, it does look good. Uh, Susan, I was just wondering if, if there's any way that you could just email us just uh, Boulevard Bowls plan for you know mask wearing and social distancing on the lanes and stuff other than that it looks it looks great yeah we certainly will do that dave i'm sorry you had to remind me yes we will get that for you awesome thank you much thank you dave that's a good point any other comments or if not i'll take a vote all um all in favor aye aye aye, aye. anyone opposed anyone abstain So moved. This next one I'm very excited about as well. Um, can I get a reading for the resolution number six? A motion to approve the participation in music education to the to be conducted in accordance with the all requirements and guidance prescribed by the Centers for Disease Control. Can I get a second? I'll second. Thank you, Rick. Any discussion? But it was nice to see some of our students on the news this week with their instruments. So that was good to see them out. So this um, this does not include the musical, right? Or the musical is already going forward without this, right? 
There is going to be a drama production. Uh, we have a student leader working with Michael Camillo. They're doing a play that doesn't require more than one person to be on stage at a time. They started rehearsals today. It will be uh, video recorded and then available to watch, um, but not, not one of our standard drama productions, sadly. But I'll take what I can get. Very proud of them for thinking outside the box to be able to make it happen, though. Me too, Kim. They've worked very hard to get here. Susan, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you just move your microphone forward a bit? Yes, I did. Thank you, Karen. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. We have an approval for music education. Um, next on our agenda is the um, budget work. So from this point, we will be um, entering into our budget work session. And I will turn it over for the initial discussion to our superintendent. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, Karen. So it is our budget work session evening. Um, thank you for moving through those agenda items uh, so we could get on to this. Karen, if you could go to my next slide. Alrighty, so tonight I want to review the list of board of ed negotiables and non-negotiables. I want to answer questions that were raised at the March first budget study session, and I want to begin a discussion of my budget plan for you. So when I looked back at the notes both Karen and Drew had taken in terms of uh, non-negotiables and negotiables, uh, nothing should surprise you on the non-negotiable list. Our mental health services are right there at the top, our professional development for social emotional learning and return to school, reading guidance, academic programming, fine arts, advanced placement in college and the high school. Again, all things I would expect. Um, you had a little harder time coming up with things that you saw as negotiable. So we talked a bit about the fifth grade field trips. We talked a bit about new bus purchases and uh, Hal raised a good question about the textbooks. So I want to um, talk about those items briefly, and I'm gonna start since I have the microphone. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about textbooks. Karen, can you back up? Thanks, dear. Um, we textbook aid is one of our formula driven aids. And we get $1 for every dollar we spend up to a certain capped amount. So you really wanna spend that money on textbooks. As I had written to the board over the weekend, um, textbook aid is a bit of a misnomer because textbook aid can be spent on software, on manuals, on music, on newspapers and magazines, on uh, materials for the Common Core Learning Standards, on Braille materials. Um, it is not truly just for specific textbooks. And at this point, we spend about 60% of our formula driven hard um, textbook aid on software applications. So we are trying to achieve that very thing that Mr. Talbot suggested to us, which is to um, move where we can uh, to more electronic um, opportunities for students. Drew, do you want to add anything about that funding piece? Basic, uh, basically, it's like $58.25 per student with the student information coming from when we submit the beds information in October, which is on our um, student enrollment. So Susan's captured it quite accurately. And Karen, would you like to add anything about the way you've been using that money? Karen, Karen controls that budget line, if you will. So Karen, if you'd 
like to add to that? Feel free. I would say that we start planning um, the software, software aid, which is also one to one aid, because in order to spend textbook aid on materials other than hard copy materials, we need to spend down our software aid. So um, we, we start those conversations in February of the previous year. We map out what can go just under software aid, what can what software can come under textbook aid, because there's definitely a checklist of what you can and can't use it for. So um, we look at that much like you look at the budget process starting the year before um, and work that through together in tandem with um, technology. Thank you, Kay. Uh, we did talk about the new bus purchases last time around. I'm just going to ask Drew to reiterate what he said about their impact and why we have the buses on the replacement schedule we do. Sure. Um, I outlined a few board meetings ago uh, the bus proposition information as well of, as well as the debt that's associated with it and the aid that we're getting related to uh, recent bus purchases. So the way it typically runs is that we're going to borrow the money if we have a successful proposition this May, we'll borrow the money in July of 2021, and then we'll receive the aid the following fiscal year. So there's no impact on the debt service payment until the 22-23 budget if in fact the public approves the May proposition. So it's in the following year of the proposition that you have to uh, worry about the debt service impact but then you also get the aid associated with it. It's also on that schedule I presented. It's back to you. All righty, and fifth grade field trips, um, we appreciate that as perhaps a spot we could look um, and we'll keep that in mind. So Karen, could you go to our next slide? There were also some things on the wish list. Uh, one of them was technology in our classrooms. We are trying to move toward being 1 to 1 for students in grades 3 through 12 as early as September of 2021. Uh, so, not only do we want to um, beef up our technology uh, in the classroom and by that, I mean, we also have a replacement plan for projectors. For computers, for laptops, for hard, uh, I'm sorry, for desktops uh, that place through every year. So many of those um, items are replaced for servers, for all of the things that fuel our technology, if you will. Um, so we, we are in a process of continuous cycle and improvement in terms of technology in our classrooms. We also want to uh, take a look at our software applications. I can tell you there is always a much greater um, desire for software, especially freebies. Um, but we do have a process for software review because you may recall me talking to you way back about how all software has to be education law 2D compliant, meaning it protects PII, personal information of students, and that uh, that in itself is now a process. So if we, if someone is using something that they think is really neat, but the vendor will not sign off on the compliance documentation. We can't use that software. So we're working through those things. The question came up about an athletic trainer. I reached out to Gervin and Perlazzo, although on the face of it, they would agree that uh, we could, for example, approach the booster club about paying for an athletic trainer that there are several other questions we would need to think about and research before we were to do that. For example, payments to um, retirement, health insurance, liability. Um, and uh, I will tell you that Patrick and I, Patrick Fitzgerald at Gervin, we will talk about this further so I can get those specifics, um, but there are some I guess I would call them hoops, pretty major hoops we'd have to take a look at. And folks are always interested in um, extracurricular options, clubs and coaches. And as you know, my um, certainly my desire is to maintain everything we have at present rolling forward. Next slide, Karen. So we talked about our buses, we talked about textbooks, we talked about the athletic trainer, 
And then there was a question about, was there any way we could generate more revenue? Um, certainly one way we could generate revenue, and we've had uh, folks approach us about this, is by renting out our turf field. Uh, however, um, right now we can't um, rent out our turf field because we are using our turf field um, exclusively. So with that, I'm gonna ask Drew to talk a little bit about um, revenue and schools and 10 schools generate revenue. The two main sources of school district revenue, as you know, are state aid from New York State Education Department and uh, the local tax levy. Sprinkled in there is some federal money from Medicaid and Medicare uh, Part D subsidy and some miscellaneous uh, revenue from billing other districts for services or charging for other services. That being said, we're, we're prohibited from doing advertisement, like using our buses for advertisements or our fencing at our fields. We cannot raise revenue that way. So um, there's tremendous restrictions on schools. So basically how you raise revenue is from the um, state, a little bit from the federal government, and a lot from the local tax levy. So are you saying you can't rent the, the all sports field? Oh, no. No, you said you could. Okay. We just right now, we don't have any way to rent it to anyone. We're using it so consistently. So it'd be a future revenue source potentially. Yes. Post COVID. And Dave, if anyone has any questions before I go on at this point, I'm happy yep. to answer them. Why don't we open it up? if anybody has any questions about these four or anything else you might want. I think my only other one was um, I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it for the next round of. So Karen, if you could put up our next slide. So folks keep asking us what's going to happen in September. Um, and honestly, I don't know. But here are the assumptions I'm making about school opening in September of 21-22. I'm going to assume that all staff and students will return in September for full day instruction. I'm uh, assuming that we are going to need additional support services, both academically and in terms of social emotional support. I'm going to um, assume that staff and students will be masked, but the requirements for social distancing may be a little bit uh, less. They're talking about three feet. Um, that would allow us to um, repopulate our classes uh, as they were populated prior to COVID. We will offer two, not three a.m. and p.m. bus runs and school times will revert to our pre-COVID times. We will continue to have additional cleaning and disinfecting needs. We will continue to provide breakfast, lunch, and meals to all students. And if a remote option is required, my hope is we can make that available through a regional approach. Um, again, my group is already talking about this. Um, because we truly do believe that students belong back in their schools. Um, I think we can see that after a year of uh, the kinds of things we've been having to do, that for many students, um, this truly is the best place for them to be. So as I started putting together my budget, um, that will become your budget, that's how I'm thinking about the reopening of school. Karen, next slide. Susan, could you just move your microphone a bit more in front of you? Sure, Karen, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Thank you. How's that? Okay. Folks, you've seen this slide before. It talks about where we are in terms of our tax levy limit at 0.13. It talks about our gap, which is about 800,000. You've tentatively decided to go out over the tax levy limit um, and cut approximately 400,000. And then at a subsequent board meeting, Dave suggested that we also look at what would it mean if we cut 200,000. Next slide. Oh, 
Okay, um, this is going to uh, be a little challenging to read and I will make sure you get copies of this in your Friday packet. What we're looking at here is what happens to our budget if you cut the 200,000, the 400,000, or the in the uh, area of 800,000. Drew, I'm gonna ask you if you want to say anything about this particular chart. So as Susan mentioned, the maximum uh, allowable tax cap to get the simple majority is a 0.13 tax levy increase. That's the amount that the taxes in total can go up from the prior year levy or approximately $41,000. Um, so that creates a $786,000 gap uh, to basically fund everything that was in the 2020-21 budget and bringing it forward. Um, so what I've presented for Susan to look at is the scenarios if we reduce the um, expenditures and subsequently the levy by 400,000 or 200,000. And you can see that to take $200,000 out, you have a 2.01% levy increase. Oh, Karen, can you go to the next slide? I'm sorry. Thank you. So you can see under, under these scenarios, it shows you that each of the um, reductions, what the corresponding levy increase would be and the corresponding expense increase would be. So hopefully that's helpful, just giving you a broad brush view of these scenarios without getting into the detail of how we would get there. So I would ask if you have any questions um, at this point about this general concept. We're trying to give you the information, what it looks like um, for each of those scenarios. And I would also just remind you that the tax levy increase is not the same as the tax rate. The tax rate won't be set until August. So this again is really what the levy will increase. Questions? No, Susan, I just wanted to let folks, the reason I asked for this, um, folks, and sorry for not getting a note out earlier because it, it was like late in the day that I actually asked for this was um, just so we had an idea if um, when we look at what cuts need to be made, what number we're going to be comfortable with, with the levy increase, um, recognizing that we we all voted that we would we all were in support of probably going over the levy um i wanted to know how much of a jump we would have to be making in each of these different various scenarios and obviously we can ratio value to come up with you know something in between but this would be the the basis of that so that's what was the idea behind it so in past years um what has been the highest point where we've gone above the tax levy and been successful or where do we try to kind of stay in a number bracket range when we're looking at this we've only once ever gone over that i remember correct yeah. me if i'm wrong too in 14 15 we had a 0.27 tax cap and we went out with a 1.76 percent um, tax levy increase. That was the only time that we've overridden the um, simple majority. We we have we have um, since I've been with the board, we have had this number in our heads of two and a half to three is never wanting to ever go above that number. Um, those were in different times, obviously. Um, we have been fortunate that we've been able, Kim, to stay under the tax levy um, for various reasons without having to do much um, damage, for the lack of a better term, to the academics and support services that we offer. Um, nice. You know, we, we, we try very hard, you know, and this is obviously one of our major, major, major parts of being on the board is the future, is to be the fiscal conscience here of, of the community and make sure that we're staying within what our community wants to see. 
Um, and this so year it's more of what can our community afford? Exactly. Also save our school at the same time. So exactly, that's the exact. Yep. Review. So. And this is based on the governor's budget, as far as aid, yes. which included which included um, that one-time federal money. Correct. That he um, replaced our state aid with. Right. Right, uh, and we, well, we do we expect that to only be once, right? Correct, and we do expect there will be additional stimulus money. If you go back a slide, Karen. I'm sorry, I missed it. Oh, yeah, there. You can see that federal stimulus phase two. We have zeros all across here because we don't know yet. One, what what we could expect or two, um, what the rules might be for how it should be spent. And you have also heard me say, and I think Drew would support me on this, whatever we have, we don't want to spend it all this year. Um, we want to position ourselves for the next two years beyond this one. Uh, so we want to be prudent because uh, even if it's over two years, it will be one time money. So once we spend it, Chances are, whatever we spend it on, especially if it were people, um, we would have to do away with. But even if you were to say to me, spend it all on technology, Susan, when we do that, then we start by building the obsolescence plan for the technology we buy. And eventually it has to be rebought. Um, so it could be five years down the road, it could be seven years down the road, it could be 10 years down the road. But there are very few things that do not at some point in time end up uh, costing us money. And we can't, just, count on, we can't count on money that we don't have yet either. So we can't plan that into the budget and say we're going to have it and then it not come and then we're in trouble. So. Correct. It, but just to be clear about that, the, the stopgap money that came. And I'm not trying to be supportive of the governor by any stretch of the imagination. Um, that money, although it was one time money was really money that came in because COVID reduced our tax base. So that piece, I'm a little less nervous about being one time money than I am. This zero line that we don't have yet is being really one time money. So my hope would be that although we may never get all the way back to our original tax base, that, that deficit number would close a little bit um and and but i do understand where dan's coming from we don't want to we don't want to be bouncing way up and then finding out that you know the tax rate is or the tax generation is still not going to be what it was expected to be so the state's going to be running a deficit again next year so Susan's correct, which is alluding to that. What we do know is that it's supposed to be um, supplanting or supplementing depends on what they're going to give us. But some it's going to supplant, some it's going to supplement. We do know that some of the money must be spent in academic intervention services. So when that comes to us, it's going to say you got to spend it in this way for the credit recovery or the lack, loss of education that our students receive. So that could be, in fact, hiring instructional staff to get through a cyclical time in our uh, scholastic year. It could be this summer. Um, and the rest of it could be uh, payment to be used over two budget years. Um, that's what I'm reading. That's what I'm, um, you know, getting in discussions with my peer group um, that there may be an allowance to use it over two budget years. They're, the um, legislature is lobbying to increase the fund balance from 4% to 8% so that we can. Um, set aside another year of this money, but Susan's correct. We don't know. It hasn't come out uh, definitively yet, but this is what it looks like. It's coming out at academic intervention and then probably 2 years worth of uh, aid and it can be used on PPE health and safety instructional um, HVAC. It's a very broad brush of what you can use in that legislation. So that that's almost like I don't want to say it's one time because Susan's right about what it can be used for. You know that very few things have 
um, forever life state surfaces. But if we needed to improve our H, our if we needed to improve our air quality, for example, that money could possibly be used for that. I just threw that out. I'm not saying that's what we need it for, but that's right. true. That's what yeah. you're saying we could do some with. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the other piece is if the fund balance goes up to 800 or we would be able to put more 8 million, we'd be able to put more into the fund balance um, to carry us over another year, two years. Correct. Okay. Anything else before I move on? So Karen, if you could go to the next slide and then if you could go one more. So this evening I'm bringing you the 200,000, um, what I'm calling tier one. And the way I would get to that 200,000 is to not replace two full-time equivalent retiring teachers. And I would tell you where that would happen. I would take one of our incoming kindergarten classes. Let me start again. Blendall right now has 28 projected incoming kindergartners. You know that our kindergarten uh, class size, not capped, but class size is 22. Glenn Warden has two classes, could have two classes with 16 in each. I would suggest we take six or eight of Glendall's incoming K students and I would be looking for those students to not already have siblings in school. I would be looking at our attendance boundaries. So you might recall at one time we moved the attendance boundaries up the hill to uh, put more uh, students into SAC. Well, now I'd move those attendance boundaries back down the hill to move children. Um, I'm sorry, I moved them to down the hill to move them into Glendall. Now I'd go the other way and move six or eight students to SAC. That would give Glendall a one class of 20, and it would give Glenn Warden two classes of 20. Again, our class size guideline is 22, so we would distribute those students a bit more evenly. And then Lincoln and SAC, as always, will have lots of kindergartners. If I were to do that, I have a retiring kindergarten teacher at Glendale. Excuse me, I simply wouldn't replace that person. So um, that would be one savings. And then the other classroom, we have one first grade going to second grade at Glendale. We have a retirement in second grade at Glendale. So that class will move into the remaining class, but I would not replace that second grade teacher. So that's how I would, quite frankly, painlessly or relatively painlessly get to that 200,000, which would then make the tax levy increase 2.02%. To get to the 400,000, we're going to take a look at extending bus runs. So that means longer time on the bus. We will have to take a look at some additional staff reductions, which could be across any number of areas, um, certificated and non-certificated. We will look at supplies. We will look at field trips. We will look at late buses. Um, again, I will try to stay away from cuts to the academic programs um, as the board had hoped. So tonight, um, you know what we can do to get to 200,000 relatively painlessly, uh, and you know where I will be looking for next week to bring you another 200,000, which I think uh, the 400,000 puts you at 1.37 on the tax levy. So the other thing you could say to me is, well, what if we only asked you to bring us another 100,000? 
which would get me under the 2.02, .02, but not be as dramatic as going to 400,000. I can do that also. So let's have a chat about what um, I've got here so far. Let me hear what your thinking is about that. Um, Drew, before we jump, can you give us a, um, just like a, a real number for that three? For what, Dave? Can you repeat the, that? The 300,000, Susan gave a number and I, I don't think I caught it, what, what the tax levy would end up at. So, 400,000 is, um, what was that, Susan? 1.37. So, if you knock the 100,000 off of that, you'd probably be like a 1.7, 1.7. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, That's Susan, okay. if you said that. That's I didn't. Okay. okay. So, why don't we, I mean, basically what we're asking Susan to do is where we're comfortable with the cuts being from what you guys are thinking of with relationship to her strategy for tier one, which seems fairly painless. Um, and what out of the items that Susan had listed, um, people were comfortable with her moving forward with those cuts or is any of those things you don't even want to entertain and would prefer something else in its place because we still have to make cuts if we want to get to 400,000 or 300,000. So why don't I just open it up and I'll go again the way I've been going because it seems to have been working okay and just go by our our um, list going down the whatever names popped up on my screen here in the order. Dave? Thoughts? Karen, would you be able to put that last screen back up? So, I mean, you know, honestly, I'd like to hear uh, more details regarding the, the tier two stuff. So, you know, before I can really say one way or the other, you know, we'll just have to wait till next week to get a little bit more details on how that stuff would happen. As much as it pains me to uh, lose a couple of positions, it does seem to be the most painless for the 200,000. So, I mean, that, that seems like a no brainer. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll comment on tier two stuff once we get a little bit more idea of really what that would encompass. Dan? I'm actually, I think, pretty comfortable going at it the 2.0 tax level. Um, you know, which would mean cutting only the tier one, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. um, a, a little bit, a little bit more, I think. Dick, can you pop that up, Karen, if you don't mind? Right. So, 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 close uh, enough. Yeah, Dan, sorry. It's close well, enough. The $200,000. I know it's a little thing, but something like late boxes, it kills me to, uh, that because um, it means people without reliable transportation can't stay late for extra help, can't stay late to participate in after school activities, clubs, sports, things like that. Um, I mean, all of these things we go down the list are tough to cut. I hate seeing that go. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Dan. I like that point. Um, Karen, do you mind going back to the list again? Thank you. Um, Kim. I'm completely comfortable with tier one. I think, you know, as Susan approached it, it was, it was great. You know, we're looking for students who are, don't have siblings in the school already. So we're not dividing families up. Um, so I'm really comfortable with that. We're just, we're just not replacing those teachers who are coming back and that just seems seamless almost there. I mean, it's not really seamless in, in the grand scheme of things, but it, it's an easy one there. Um, late buses, you know, I love late buses because kids can stay after school. They can be part of programs that they're not normally a part of, but 
can we look at other virtual items to help them if they need to stay after school or tutorial classes and study hall. Um, so that might be something we can play with a little bit there. Um, extended bus runs, I do, depending on how long the bus is, I kind of feel it's hard for our littles to be on a bus for an hour or 45 minutes, um, especially because, you know, they're little and, you know, sometimes they need to use the bathroom and they're stuck on a bus. Um, but that's just the real life part of that. Additional staff is hard for me because I feel that we are coming back um, to school and our students are going to need every single help and every single teacher that we need. So if we're doing additional staff, I'd like to try to not go into those teachers or anybody who is um, pertinent in our education. I know everybody is, but those aides and stuff are really important too. Um, and field trips, I am all about maybe getting rid of field trips for a year just to, so we can focus on our academics. I know they're important, but I really think that that's something we can, I'm really comfortable taking off. Thanks, Kim. Pam? Um, I have been through getting rid of all the tier things to more, the, the tier two things more than once in my tenure on the board. Late buses, we've all, we fought time and time again <laughs> to get back. God. We've, um, you need your supplies. You don't want kids on the bus for a long time before they get to school in the morning. Then they're all wound up or, you know, tired or however it happens to affect those kids. We have fought so hard to get additional staff back when we've had to cut staff. Um, I am perfectly happy with the tier one cut, go out with a 2% levy increase. Um, Drew told us last week that the average that we've been going out over the, like the last 10 years has been 2%. So we're not asking the public for any more than we have asked them for on the average over the last umpteen years. And I really have no problem with so ever with just doing tier one and calling it quits. Um, Rick. So I, I feel like we might, I, you know, over the last, you know, six months, we've seen a lot of uh, teachers retiring through, through our agendas here. It'd be great to see if there's additional opportunities to not replace retiring teachers since that seems so painless to everybody. For now, and then should money start to flow back into the district, we can we can hire and replace those those teachers. So, I would I would like to see if there's additional opportunities there, and if there is, perhaps that would get us closer to the three or four hundred thousand dollars that we're looking for. Because um, yeah, none of those tier two things are very exciting to me to to lose at all. Um, but I would like to be below too. Um, you know, the 1.7 is attractive. So yeah, I would, I would definitely be interested in seeing Susan's $300,000 uh, tier, you know, what, what that would look like. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Uh, so Susan, right now we're, we're looking at the two teachers you had said would be from Glendale. Correct, that's where those sections are. And then the kids that we would have to take from Glendale to put to the other schools, would they permanently be placed there or yes. would they, they wouldn't, okay. So they would still be there, right? Correct. Yes, once I move them, I wouldn't move them again. Okay. Um, and not ever wanting to talk about raising taxes. I know it's a, a very touchy subject, especially in Scotia Glenville, but just for giggles, um, what would it be, Drew? If we went out at, you know, we don't want to cut anything from our budget. We know times are tough, but we don't want our kids to sort of be hurt anymore. What would the number be if you have an idea of, you know, what would the average per household be if we went out at trying to just balance our budget and said, this is why we're doing this. So how, um, as you know, a 2.66 was the levy we would need to do if we went out with um, this year's budget rolled over into next year's cost. Um, the tax rate's about $23 per thousand. The average house of 160,000. You take the 160,000 divided by a thousand and times 23, that's what it costs per household. Um, 
and I'll be providing that as we move along the budget process is the average cost to a house. Um, so it could be seven dollars per household, ten, whatever, depending on it is. But it, it gets down to it's on top of what they're paying now. So we have to be very careful when we look at that impact on a household. It's on top of everything else they're they're already paying, and that's how people tend to look at it. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. Just was curious what that number might or may not be. It gets really tricky because the difference between the tax levy and the tax rate. It's not usually lower though, right? True. On the oops, okay. yes, it can, Dave. Um, typically, um, because of the assessed value growth in the district. That's right. The value growth. Yep. As recent as last year, we had a lower tax yeah. rate than the tax levy, I believe. Yeah. Who did I miss? Me. I guess it's me. Okay, I, I'm um, a little bit like Dave with with knowing a little bit more about the additional staff. I, I definitely don't want to extend bus runs again. I remember when we extended bus runs and kids were on the bus for like a ridiculous amount of time. Um, I don't know what supplies we're talking about, so I don't know what that would would entail, you know, I have a love for field trips having been on them. Um, if, if there was one thing here, I kind of would accept that probably b would be it, but I don't want to be thinking that I don't like field trips because I really do. The late buses are very important. I, I think we learned when we had to do away with late buses. I don't know who remembers that, but um we were not able to get kids in clubs because they didn't have a way to stay after school they weren't able to go to tutoring I, Chris, Susan, correct me if i'm wrong we even had to change the way we did detention because kid, kids couldn't like stay after school um i'm comfortable and i you know i hear what rick's saying i don't know if there'd be a way to not fill another retiring teacher. Um, I know you've already built into this a reduction in the cost of replacing yeah. top tier teach. I don't want that said that wrong. Teachers that are at the highest level of their um, tier income with teachers who were just starting or in the middle of their tier income. Um, that but recognizing the fact that this community is struggling financially because of covid um i, I think anything more we take away from the kids is it's going to carry a second year of having trouble giving them everything they need to get back to where they should be academically um i'm comfortable honestly with with just the tier one but i also wouldn't mind hearing what a three hundred thousand number was um but that said i i i don't think i can live with the four hundred thousand because it looks like it would be something out of all five of these would have to be to get you to four hundred unless i'm totally missing it susan um I'm comfortable with tier one. I wouldn't mind hearing what a tier three, I'm sorry, what a 300,000 would be. So how, if we kept it at the tier one, um, what do we, do we feel that's something that we could pass? Because it's not something that we're asking more of than we did any other year. It's not, it's kind of around the same percentage. The problem is though, Kim, is that you're now talking um going for a 60 percent passage not saying that's not impossible not saying we haven't been above 60 to other years but it does require 60 percent to pass okay so if it was borderline it'd be, it'd be easier it'd be it's tough there's no way we can possibly stay below 
I don't personally feel, and I think all of you folks felt the same way when we talked about this the last time. Yeah, there's no way I think to say, we no. have to go over the tax levy. It's really a question of what we're comfortable with going over the tax levy. I, I just personally just can't see us cutting program from these kids who have suffered for 18 months. Well, will have suffered for almost 18 by the time we're back in school. Um, I agree with you on that. It's just so hard to find. I don't, I don't want to take away as much as we can. And nobody does want to take away, but especially coming through COVID, I think that we really need what we have. Are we comfortable then with asking Susan to do the 300 and I'm fine if we want to try the 400, although I don't think I could support a $400,000 cut. Um, are we comfortable with just having those come back to well, have the we, discussion next meeting? Does anybody know of a sports team that has $800,000 that would like to rent our athletic field by chance? <laughs> if we could get the Giants to bring training camp back, if that would be Rick. That'd be great. Exactly. Or, or the United States lacrosse team. You must have a connection there. Actually, they're um, coming to Albany. So yeah, I, I know. I, I saw that. that I saw that's that. probably what uh, prompted me to say say that. In, in all seriousness, though, that we should we should co combine it with cuts and and opportunities for revenue, and that that yeah. field is is something that we may want to look into. I know it's not going to be the eight hundred thousand, but um, you know, we should challenge ourselves to, to at least look into it. I do know that that when we were proposing this, that was one of the things we had spoken about was maybe doing being able to get sectional games, you know, at our field, being able to um, run um, tournaments at our field and things. So I don't disagree at all. The issue, our is folks, we don't have a lot of, the issue with that right now is we don't have a lot of surplus uh, time, right? We it, it's being yes. heavily used by our sports, which obviously would be the first priority. And I don't think there's a lot of surplus time on the fields, which is available for right now, yeah. right now. Well, you say, you say that, but we're not 100% sure about that, Dan. You know, it, 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 no. we could not be using it on the weekend. There's a, uh, there, there may be folks that are willing to use it after 8.30, you know, and, and, and it'd be worth it for us, so. So are, are we comfortable then with, with Susan coming back with that, I'd like to give her some direction that we're comfortable with hearing from. I'm absolutely I mean, are, comfortable with that. I think that that's, that's a good plan to start where, where we're at right now. I, I think that's a perfect idea. Thank you, Kim. Um, I, I'm going to go through a little straw poll here. Dan? So I'm comfortable, you know, I'm, I would be open to seeing what we have at 300,000 cuts. Where I'm leaving right now is to do 200,000, but um, I'm interested to see what 300 looks like. Good. Um, Dave. Uh, I agree with Dan. I'm good with tier one. I'd like to see her like tier one A. Hal. Uh, yeah, I'm up for anything. Uh, Pam. I'm happy with tier one, but I would like just like to see what it would be if we cut 300,000. Uh, Rick? I mean, 300,000 is of a $60 million budget is is what uh, 0 0.005%. I, I feel like, I don't know, I, 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 I'm new to this, but I feel like there's a, you got to take a look at a cost benefit analysis. You know, if, if I'd like to see what tier two, the different bullet points actually, you know, would save us. And also if there's opportunities in tier one for additional retiring teachers. So I, I, hopefully that helps Dave. That's what I have. Yeah, I think, I think you're in the same spot, just a little different part of it. But yeah, I think Rick, you're, I hear what you're saying. I think that's fine. I think we could do that with Susan. My, um, I didn't forget anyone, did I? Pam, I gave, got you, didn't I? My my name's just flipped on my screen for some weird reason. Um, I feel in the same way. I you know, um, Susan, I think 
what we're saying is is that you know if you can look to see if there's anything more with teachers I, i'm sure you did but if you can bring back your thoughts with that and or if you do find something um the other thing is if you can give us a little bit more detail about your cuts here but it sounds like we're comfortable with with landing a little bit around that two mark as opposed to um really dropping down much further but if you can give us like kind of idea of what excuse me those two tier tier two cuts would be um i think we're we're thinking of landing in that place and you know like rick and others so other people have said you know maybe there's something in that upper tier one that could be also adjusted but is that kind of give you a direction yes thank you absolutely i think you know, I think that was good ideas. Yeah, just simply said, did you have any other questions for me tonight? I, oh, but I appreciate all your work looking into this. It's not a, an easy thing to do, but um, I feel that you guys kind of have more knowledge what can work to be cut there than those of us who are like, no, we want to keep that. And you give us some good reasons why um, things need to be cut. So. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. So we, we've we have 30 people that have been on this call outside of the board. And I would ask that each of you that have um, comments or statements or thoughts or questions to honestly please use that that opportunity on the website to share those with with the school and with the board. Um, I can tell you from past budgets, it's extremely helpful um, to hear that. It, it has a very big impact on the thinking process. Um, I do want everybody to know that the budget process is far from done and you will have an opportunity. We will be doing a public hearing of some sort in which the public will get to express their comments on the budget. Um, you know, sometimes we do it in small work groups. Sometimes we do it in one big giant one. We'll see how that that works out, but we will have a public hearing. Um, I, I'm not promising again, because I did promise before that we can be in person because it's beyond my control. Some people test positive and we can't end up doing it. So um, I'm hoping we can. Um, can you put the agenda back on? Karen, if you don't mind. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody, um, both at the administration and the board level, because I can tell the thoughts that everybody have got, it's gone through to try to think about this. I think next week we'll have some more data, more information that we can um, really buckle down on. Hopefully we'll have some information on the stimulus money as well. Um, that'll give us a better idea of some of those um, things that may not be reoccurring immediately expenses that we could do and also savings that we could accomplish. So thank you all for a very productive work session. I hope Susan, Drew feel the same way and Karen. Um, and with that, um, Susan, I was going to turn it to you to your regular report. Um, actually, Dave, that will cover it for me. So if you'd like to move on to the report of staffing, um, do have a recommendation for staffing tonight. Um, this is kind of a quirky thing. Um, Karen, I'm going to ask you to jump in if I leave anything out. <clears throat> we have determined that we have additional students at SAC and Lincoln who need academic intervention services between now and the end of the school year. We have a teacher who's been out on leave who thought they would be on leave through the end of the year, uh, one of our reading specialists. Um, but as it turns out, she's ready to come back to work. Um, by creating this uh, full-time position between now and the end of June, 
we keep the substitute teacher who's in for the reading teacher in place working with the children she's been working with. And then we bring back our teacher from leave and she becomes the person who provides those academic intervention services at SAC and Lincoln for the remainder of the year. So this position goes away in June. It is truly a short term position. Karen, what didn't I say about that that I should have? You explained it perfectly. Okay, so that's what we're asking you to do is to create that position for us because I can't bring someone back if I don't have a spot for them. So I'm asking you to create that position and then we will bring you the person who will fill that position most likely next week. Thank you. Can I get a motion? I'll move that the Board of Education approve the creation of a 1.0 FTE elementary AIS position for the period of March 22nd through June 30th, 2021. Thank you. I'll second. I'll second. second that. Yep. Kim, thank you. Any questions for Susan on that? Hearing no questions, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So passed. Thank you. I think that's really great that we can do that. Um, other business. Does anyone have any other business they'd like to bring up at this point? Uh, I'd like to chat about one thing if we can. I know there's some attendees that are anxiously waiting to hear about uh, fall to cheer, which we had talked about having on our agenda, but I, I don't see it here. Correct. Oh, Dave, you were missing. That's right. Um, you were uh, not in the previous session. Um, Susan, is there anything you can. Well, maybe just to let the some of the parents and stuff know, you know, what because there, there's a lot of misinformation, miscommunication amongst, yep. you know, uh, admin and parents and kids. And, you know, there's there's some anxious children sitting by listening, you know, waiting to hear what we're going to say. So, um, you know, it's probably better to do it publicly so that at least they know where everybody's coming from. So I will um, relate to you how I believe this situation played out. Um, Coach uh, Kaylee needs eight cheerleaders to do the type of stunt cheerleading that we do in competition. As of early last week, we had five young women who were interested and we put out an all call through our physical education classes for any other students who want to cheer. We did not get any other students who wanted to cheer. Some of our students who were cheering are now playing other sports um, which I'm sure uh, became part of the challenge for them um, is uh, they just don't fit into the schedule. Although Coach Kaylee was willing to coach five students, as she pointed out, um, we couldn't do competition stunting with five girls. We need more. So she and Mr. Rockhill had a conversation and we decided we would not offer cheer in fall too. When this first came up with the board, one of the things that the board had shared with me was that um, particularly our seniors were concerned because they needed film footage um, or chose would choose to have film footage as they applied to colleges of their cheering. Uh, perhaps to help with scholarships or participation at the collegiate level. However, 
even if we were to have these five young ladies cheer, we are going to be able to do, again, my understanding, competition stunt cheering safely because there are not enough young women participating. So based upon all of those things, um, we determined that we would not offer cheer in fall two. All right, so just, just one, <coughs> one quick question. Um, fall two cheer is not, I'm told it's not competition stunting. There is no stunting. It's sideline work only, um, which would somewhat negate that that you know safety thing that the AD had brought up, the safety concern. And again, I I don't know enough about cheer, and I apologize for my you know I'm remiss to say I don't know enough, but uh, just so that we have everything on the table, so everybody knows exactly what we're dealing with. And like I said, we're, we're told that fall two cheer is sideline only, no stunting, that they've had five in the past. Football last year had many games where they had five cheerleaders. So we're, I just want everyone to be on the same page, you know, parents and, and students alike when we say you girls can't compete. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm happy to go back and have that conversation with uh, the AD and Kaylee since they are the folks who gave me the information I have, Dave. Um, and it was very clearly presented to me as um, stunting. Again, if um, we're talking about sideline, um, I guess what I would call more traditional cheering, um, that was not what was originally raised by the board. But at that, I'm happy to go back and have the conversation with Jamie and Jamie and Kaylee again tomorrow. Okay, I mean, I, I, listen, I know it's more work. No, I mean, I, I know it's more work in the middle of a budget and, you know, there's tons of stuff. I mean, these, these girls have some, three of them have worked their entire high school career to, you know, try to be able to participate in this for us this year and to represent their, you know, not only their, their sport, which they're so emphatically you know, psyched about, but also our school at events that may other schools may have their own cheer team there. You know, so I mean, it's I, we're just trying to cover all our bases. So these kids know that, you know, like we went to bat as much as we could for them and, and the school did everything they could. It just sometimes it just doesn't work out. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Rather than waiting a couple of weeks, can is it possible for the board to approve cheer tonight? And should you find a way to do it? We don't have to wait two weeks. You wouldn't wait two weeks anyway, Rick. We would uh, vote on Monday. But if in fact something could happen, I will do what I traditionally do, which is give people the authority to start in advance. Wonderful. We're back, we're back on Monday. We're back yeah. next week. So. Even and one week, it won't one or two weeks. I'm I'm used to the two weeks, but you're right. So, but I just wanted to hear that. That's great. Thank you, Susan. That's great. Sure. I think game film, because I'm I'm assuming that was referred to what I said, has more to do in stunting, with form and cadence and voice and pitch. So, I get that fact uh, of the whole stunting, but I've seen videos online of Scotia cheerleaders stunting with for cheerleaders doing it. So, you know, I, I wasn't referring to they only can do this with stunting, but sorry, I should have been more clear, I guess. But uh, game film has a lot more to do in than pyramids as, as most athletes and cheerleaders know way more than I do about cheerleading. But um, I, I just think big picture, it's you're, you're taking those five girls and you're saying, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We, we can't even let you do sideline cheerleading without stunting safely. I think Susan's got a plan. I don't think we need to. She's going to speak to the coach. Um, and let us know how what the coach feels. And what can be done so. They, I, I think everybody does appreciate that. You're going to take another look at it so.
any other business? Dave, I'm sorry to, to do this, but I feel like we're being asked to beat a dead horse. We have gone through this stuff with the cheerleading several times. And Susan has done her best and talked to all the people and may have come with a decision that we should not have fall to cheer. And I really think that we should end it. We should say, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry for these five girls. But at this point in time, it's not going to work out. And we should drop the subject. You know, Pam, it is it is important at some point to drop subjects, but if, if some of us on the board really want to express the way that the community is, is relaying to us what's important, especially during this time, it's important to be able to talk about it in this forum. So I would I would disagree. I don't think it's a dead horse. I don't think and sports in general is maybe we're, we're really talking a lot about it, but that's what's on the table right now. Um, we do need to get the budget and really sp spend a lot of attention on that. But, you know, there, there's a whole big pie of students and sports is part of it. And we're, we're going to move on to other stuff, I'm sure, over time. But I disagree. This is not a dead horse. And it's important to one student. It should be important to all of us here on the board if it's just one. That's what I have. Sorry. Thank you. I, I, no, I hear you, Rick. Well, but I, I, the one thing I do want to say, and I don't disagree with what you said, but one of the th key pieces is there. Parents have got to start going through the channels that they need to go through, which is to the administration and not through the board, because messages get confused when it comes to us. If if the messages go directly to the administration, email, online, like I've said probably 140 times and people are tired of it, there's both a public record of it, but also the very clear, concise, their words coming to 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 us and and we could advocate for that and it, there's no problem with letting us know as well um but we really need people to start communicating directly through the channels that make the biggest impact and those channels are the administration and the school website that's really where people have got to start communicating because that's where that that way the direct message is being heard. I think everything everybody said is is correct, but I just would hope we can start moving in that direction where we're not conduits of information. We're not conduits for people's concerns because it isn't direct message to the administration is going to get a lot clearer response and a lot clearer action than coming you know through us to them and really is the way you know clear communication would happen i but couldn't I do agree, hear that day, I couldn't agree more I email couldn't agree. to everybody on the board not just an email to one board member but if it's important enough for one board member to know these specifics it's important enough for all the board members to know these stuff yep agreed 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 okay any other new, uh, any other, other business? Any other, other business? Okay. If not, I would remind everyone that we are meeting next week. Um, I'll ask um, Susan if we could send an email around midweek to see um, where folks are with the potential of being back in person um, in the comfort level everyone has. Um, remind folks that the hearing and privilege of the floor um, is not happening tonight, but we do, you know, as just about everybody is so stated, you know, please use the communication lines. We really appreciate it. And um, we'll meet next week. Next week is a regular scheduled board meeting that will have um, school board business. But in addition to that, a section of that meeting will be dedicated to continued work on the budget. Do we have a need to go into exec session? If I'm hearing no one speak up, then I will ask for a um, I'm motion to adjourn. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
second. Anyone? I'll second it. I'll second. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Anyone against adjourning? Adjourning? Anyone abstaining from adjourning? We are so adjourned. I hope everyone has a safe and healthy week. Um, talk to everyone again on Monday or see everyone on Monday, one or the other. And be well, be safe, and um, talk soon. Bye Thank all. you all. Thanks for your work tonight.